All right, and we're back for another episode of Lakers Fast Break Podcast. It's Gerald Glassford coming right back at you here from the Lakers Fast Break. Pop Culture Cosmos, Inside Sports Fantasy Football, and Game Source. We truly appreciate everyone out there listening to all of our shows. And if you can, please give, give, please give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Plus, if you can like, share, subscribe, follow, or do anything that you can to support us right here at the Lakers Fast Break, Pop Culture Cosmos, Lakerholics.com, and everyone at the awesome Hoop Heads Podcast Network at HoopHeadsPod.com. It is sincerely appreciated. But we were planning on stopping by and giving you guys all the latest goings on in the world of basketball, along with our thoughts on trade targets and things of that nature for the offseason for the Lakers on Thursday. We were going to record and drop it on Friday, but you know what? It's I liken it to a game I just reviewed right now this week for the Pop Culture Cosmos in Chivalry 2. Because really, when it comes down to it, if you play that game, it's organized chaos. And that is what happened in the past 24 hours with the NBA. Organized chaos. We have playoff upsets. We have coaches getting fired. We have front office shakeups because of analytical people, because of front office people. Longtime vice presidents are gone because star players are upset. We've got a whole bunch of drama going on all over the place. We've got major injuries. We've got playoff upsets. We've got you know players all going into COVID protocol. We've got so much news we want to hit you up with. So we decided let's go ahead and move it up to today. For recording now so we can go ahead and give you an update what's going on with the nba playoffs and all the latest news and we'll go ahead on our sunday night telecast aka monday for when the podcast drops we'll go ahead and give you our thoughts on what's going forward if we were the los angeles Lakers, who should we target and all that so we'll go ahead and drop that for you on monday's show but here today to start off with i'm hoping for more entries i think that because the game's still going on between the clippers and the jazz but this guy, because he's on the East Coast, wanted to start a little bit early. You got to catch what he wants to do at Lakerholics.com. He is our basketball historian and a guy who is also, like me, always loves the NBA news. It is the Magic Man, Sean Grice. And Magic Man, great to have you aboard once again. Thank you very much, Gerald. And um, you were right. It was organized chaos today. And uh, it's kind of funny, halfway through reading uh, the day's events in the NBA, I had this Stranger Things theme running through my head, as if it would have been the perfect theme for what was going on in the day. Um, just really strange. Well, I, 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 actually, I actually thought for me it would have been more like the Keystone Cops, personally, because uh, everything seemed to be going blah, 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 all over the place. Touche. Touche. That's a that's be, that's a better analogy. I agree. Um, Absolutely. Well, hey, you know what? We're going to go ahead and start first and give everybody an NBA playoffs update. First off, there's a game that's underway. We're going to go ahead with 59 seconds left. The Clippers. My oh my! What a surprise in Utah. Are leading by seven over the Utah Jazz, and we'll talk about that game coming up here in a few minutes. But we'll let that game finish. And I know the other guys, hopefully when they come on, they'll have stuff to say to say about it too. But we're going to start with some playoff upsets in Philadelphia, where a team that has been so dominant at home, in fact, last season, it was even more ridiculous, their home advantage to what they were on the road. This year, even notwithstanding, they still had a very dominant home record. But the Philadelphia 76ers now find themselves on the verge of elimination. Yes, the number one seed in the East thought they would have an easy time of it in this round against Atlanta. But you know what? Trey Young has said, eh, eh, I am growing up and I've all grown up now. You know, I'll tell you what, it's been such a great showcase and a great coming out party for him. For years now, he has been hearing how he was the uh, the the lesser part of the Luka Doncic trade, and he's been hearing that for years now and years, and it's going on three years now, almost four. And I'll tell you what, it's something that he has taken hard. And look at it now, Luka Doncic is now in the middle of Dallas upheaval and chaos, and my friend, we now have Trey Young commanding with 30 averaging well over 30 points a game providing over 10 assists a game 
He's been doing a tremendous job. And I'll tell you what, Magic Man, it gets no better than the performance he's doing right now. He is growing up in front of our eyes as the Atlanta Hawks now lead three games to two. Uh, Jero, Trey Young's uh, mojo is impressive. Um, he just has a, a command about him now when he has the ball. He, he kind of reminds me a, a little bit of, um, you know, a Pedro Martinez or a Kobe Bryant where in they get their ball, it's their ball. I'm going to hold it for five seconds. I'm going to hold it for 18 seconds, but it's my ball until I decide to give it up. And uh, you just love to see that out of the uh, young player. I remember Kobe maturing in that fourth as well. I, mean, I, I really don't see Trey Young um, getting past the um, Eastern Conference Finals if Atlanta does pull his series out, but... His trajectory is impressive. He's an MVP candidate, I would say, moving forward in the NBA. And I would say, you know, Atlanta has a lot of good problems to look at right now because Lou Williams and Trey Young in the backcourt is a problem for Philadelphia's all defensive um, uh, tandem of. Um, Simmons and Pebble. Um, it, they just create a lot of mismatches and lose proving once again that um, anywhere other than the Clippers, really, he's he's a difference maker in the playoffs, or, or he can be. Um, he was with Toronto. Um, he never made the playoffs with us, but I sure loved his uh, punch off the bench. And... Um, it looks like Philly's in a bit of a pickle here because this is going at least seven. And if uh, the Nets finish off the Bucks here, you know, there's KD just waiting for you. Well, we'll see what happens with that. We'll talk about KD's performance here in a few minutes. But also here with us today is a good man indeed. you got to catch whatever he's doing as part of Lakerholics.com. Felix, you're right. These injuries are crazy. And we're going to go into all that as far as a major news update is concerned. But first off, it is Atlanta and Philadelphia with Atlanta taking a three games to two lead as they head back to Atlanta. But it is L. Rob and L. Rob, as Felix gives you the shout out there on the comment board. Great to have you here, my friend. I mean, you've got to be impressed with the bravado, with the confidence that Trey Young and this young Atlanta squad now has. Absolutely, and uh, um, shout out to Felix. But, Gerald, you picked, I think, out of our panel when we did uh, our predictions before the playoffs. You, I mean, I went with the Knicks. I thought the Knicks would be the line in seven, and uh, Atlanta handled them very, very easily. So um, you you were you were on to the Hawks early, um, so kudos to you. But they are playing exceptional for a young team like that to have no fear to come back from 25 down late in the third quarter and win in Philadelphia in a game five, you know, it's hard to think back to a really young team that has won that type of game in that real first taste of playoff experience. I mean, that's, that's very, very, very rare. So you have to give Nate McMillan and you have to give, you know, all those guys, uh, you know, a lot of credit. Uh, um, so Philadelphia may not make it back. And, um, you know, it's a lot of blame to go around. Uh, you gotta I, I'm going to say the key, the key turning point, if Atlanta wins a series, is Joel Embiid in the second half of game four going 0 for 10 or 0 for 12, really at a time where he, especially missing that easy shot near the end, absolutely yeah. just blew it. And, yeah, uh, to me right there, I think that's where the series has turned. Yeah, and I, I just, I just, you know, I don't know why Doc even call, keep calling those plays. And then the guys aren't um, like Jim Jackson said today. Sometimes you can't do the play that the coach called if it's not there. You know, when you've seen uh, – uh, there was a couple times when uh, Harris toward the end of the game was trying to run whatever the coach said and and threw, he threw the ball away one time. Another time he's got – he, you know, he's, he's driving. He's got Gallo underneath the basket. Why are you trying to – 
kick it back to MB 15 feet away from the basket when you're within three, five feet from the basket. And, you know, if he goes strong, then he probably gets an and one. Um, so, yeah, I feel bad for him because he kind of unraveled there, I thought, uh, a lot. But I don't know if it's a lot of that's a reflection on Doc. Is you know, at some point when your teams are constantly – kind of gagging at some point it's something you're doing you you are not instilling confidence in those guys for some reason they are playing scared out there I i'm going to tell you right now you and i are thinking alike my friend i was just going to ask a magic man the next question after you're talking is is this another one of those doc rivers three you know big game choke jobs as far as in a big series like this because We've seen it before, correct, El Rob, where he's done this for, in yeah. fact, last year for starters. You know, he he's had the advantage, the tactical advantage and the game's advantage, and he's not gotten away with it. And tonight, I mean, a collapse like very few others we have seen at home. You get outscored by 21. You give up 40 points at home in a playoff game. Magic Man, that is in excusable if it was me i would go laker tom and if it was the lakers i would go laker tom on somebody and i would just rant and yell and scream and rave that i think the coach would be fired and all that stuff but to me that is just inexcusable in the fourth quarter of a playoff game game five not game one game five a pivotal game in the series you give up so many points in that fourth quarter 100% correct, Gerald, and you just identified the effect of a choke job, a true choke job. You're at home in a pivotal game, and you just lay an egg in the fourth quarter. Yeah. That That is the trifecta of choke, and they have nobody to blame. They have nobody to blame but themselves. The trifecta of, clo- of the club choke. <laughs> But I, I tell you what, if Doc Rivers thought he caught some heat the way the Clippers went out last year, you have not felt the wrath of some fans until you feel the wrath of Philly fans. Exactly. Oh, this man. will be the longest summer of his life. If the, if, I mean, the whole thing, last, I mean, 12 hours ago, or go back to the last game when they were, when they were right there, you thought they was going to win that. And then today, you get the news that Leonard may be out for the rest of the playoffs, that yes. Chris Paul's going down. You see Harden can hardly move. Philly yes. fans had visions of hoisting the tr- championship trophy. And then, you know, uh, you know, hours later to see their team. You're up by 20. Game, They're up by 20 in the second half. They are. Yeah, I, I would love to be tuned into one of these Philly radio talk stations right about now. I know they are going nuts. Absolutely. Well, As well they should. Lee, Lee Brian, Brian Westbrook has, uh, I believe, a radio show in Philly, and I'm sure it's going to be lit tomorrow. Oh, man. Oh, yeah. man. Absolutely. But, again, it is now the Atlanta Hawks going back to Atlanta with a three games to two lead after one of the major collapses ever in NBA playoff history, just inexcusable for Philadelphia to do that. And you, like you said, El Rob, the, the Philly fans are brutal. Remember, these are the same fans that snowballed Santa Claus. So, you know what, there's nothing is off limits for them. And especially with the way the coaching changes are right now and the way the coach, the, just basically everything that's going on, uh, it, just you make the wrong mistake like that and it could cost your job. I don't think it'll cost Doc Rivers his job because it is his first year. But then again, we've already seen two first year coaches fired already. So it could be a third on the way if we keep at it like this. But we'll wait and see. Again, this, the series shifts to Atlanta coming up in a couple of days here. So we'll see how that pans out. But right now, I do want to go ahead and mention that it's still an update. The game is still going on in the final seconds. 116 to 111 Clippers. Will they manage to pull it out? We'll wait and see. I know that we're going to talk about playoff P and actually we'll have some kind things for once to say about playoff P, but that's coming up here in a bit. But first off, I want to go ahead, L Rob, and ask you this, the performance last night for Brooklyn against Milwaukee and also bad coaching in Milwaukee. Again, as we talk about Budenhoser, but I want to ask you this, the performance by KD. I had mentioned this a few years ago. 
And this was when KD and LeBron met up in the finals uh, the first time, and KD outdueled LeBron in the playoffs. I had said that that time for a brief moment. I think for that, I'll say for the, at least the first few, first few months of that, you know, after that performance, whatnot, KD was the best player on the planet. And you know, people could argue with me all you want or whatnot, but last night, going 49 points, I think 17 rebounds and 10 assists, truly a spectacular performance, played all 48 minutes and brought his team back from the dead to beat a team in Milwaukee that had the lead, another team that choked a, another lead out there and just coughed it up in the in the fourth quarter. Not as large of a lead, though, but still it was a, a double-digit lead at one point. Milwaukee, you just got to say – they're finding ways to lose rather than they're finding ways to win. But L Rob, just a spectacular performance and one of the best games I've ever seen anyone play. Yeah. I think that was uh, um, the first piece, the first player to do the, the to do the 49, 17, 10. Um, the only other players to do it was Will Chamberlain and, um, and the Elgin Baylor. I There's only been that. five players that have ever done a 40 point triple double in the playoffs. So, yeah, it's, okay. a, it's a very limited yeah. list. Yeah, well, they, Will and those guys did it. Uh, I think you got to get up to 49 and then you got to get up to 17 yeah. rebounds, too. So, that probably eliminates everyone else. But they did theirs in the regular season. So, yeah. When, you, was, when yeah. you do 20 or 30 in the playoffs, in fact, I was watching some YouTube videos of him doing like 20 or 30 in the finals as far as rebounds are concerned, as adding it, chipping in another 40 or 50 points. And that was just like mind boggling. And then I, I saw him uh, in a uh, closing out the series against the Knicks, get like 10 block, eight block shots. And it's just, it's just crazy. Just crazy. Like video game stuff yeah. for him. But, but yeah, yeah just a but just a tremendous performance by him. You got to be impressed. And again, he is playing like the best player in the world right now. Yes. Yeah, so, um, you know, when you go back to that series where, you know, people ignoring it, KD, it, it, yes, I could see that, but it still was a little bit. Um, it just you don't get it every game. game. You don't get it, it every game. He needed a little bit more, even though he outdo LeBron in the finals. I think that was the game LeBron opened up the finals with like 50, right? Didn't he drop 50 like yeah, in the first but, game of that but, series? But, but he closed it out so strong against yeah, LeBron, right. and that and so that time he it was did. that time, but that he was before did. all the injuries. He had, he had, he had, I mean, he had, he had the Splash Brothers. He had Draymond. Yes, he yeah. closed it out, and he was great. But when you had that kind of comfort level, where you only you can save your, you know, pick your spots, and and you don't, and every and everybody else is chipping in, then it's easy. But yes. He is making his statement right now that I am the best player in the league. That was an incredible. That was one of the all-time greats. That's one of those you'll you'll always remember, just like LeBron dropped 50 or whatever. LeBron did 45 and whatever on in game five against Boston when he was under a lot of pressure. Um, the thing is, LeBron has had a lot of those type games. I mean, he's had so many that you don't really remember some of the ones he's had. But KD is making his his push. Uh, Kawhi was making a strong statement that, hey, I am the best player. Yeah. Uh, Embiid is, was kind of making a, a statement. So, you know, guys are jostling. Um, but we KD, think with KD, I, the thing with KD, though, and I want to give him a little bit of props again, played every single minute of the game, and he played defense strong. And the thing is with Mike Budenholzer, and let me turn it also over to at, and give it this guy a chance. He is the mastermind behind Lakerholics.com. It is Laker Tom. Tom, we're talking about the Brooklyn series right now and with Budenholzer. And L. Rob, I'm, let me tell me if you concur as well. Uh, and uh, you can interject as well on this. Mike Budenholzer, okay, this is the second year row. I've met, I'm going to mention this. Yes, P.J. Tucker has had moments in time against KD, but also there's been time in the series that he's gotten roasted. And you have this seven-foot player that's athletic, and is supposed to be an all-time de great defensive player on the team named Jantas Atentacumpo. And Jantas Atentacumpo, for the second year row, is not consistently playing defense on the other team's star player. We saw it last year with Butler from Miami. He didn't play defense on him. He played like his still, like his swing, or he's guarding someone. He wants to play off the defense. Laker Tom, if you have a player like that, 
wouldn't you at least go ahead and just give PJ Tucker a break and put in Bryn Forbes for some extra shooting and to say, you know what, Giannis, play like the all defensive player <laughs> I know you can play. Yeah, I tend to agree with you. And and second year in a row. Second well, but, year in it, a row. But, you have, but you also probably have to understand that Giannis' strength is not being a lockdown defensive player, frankly. But that's not his defensive team. strength. His defensive strength is that he's got a great body. He can he can block shots in the low post. He's uh, a physical player and so forth. But he doesn't have the quickness to to stay with Durant. And and uh, I think his coach may have made the decision not to not to put him on Durant simply to save him from being embarrassed. Um, but there's also a second part of that 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 goes that defense is as much a mental game as it is a physical game. And the difference between guys like LeBron James and Anthony Davis, who both volunteered for the challenge to guard the other team's most effective player, rather than shying away from it, like a lot of the other superstars in the league seem to do. Um, and so I think that it's it, part of it is Part of it is maybe the coach recognizing that his player is not that kind of player who has the physical or the mental ability to go out there and take a challenge like trying to shut down one of the top scorers in the league, you know. And and believe me, you know, I mean, I'm not a KD fan, to be honest with you. Um, and I'm sure I'm not a Brooklyn Nets fan, but that was one of the greatest playoff performances I've ever seen. And, uh, you know, who's the greatest player today or this week or this month or so forth, you know, screw, throw the injuries out the door and so forth. That opens up opportunities for everybody. But, uh, you know, uh, this has been a season of unprecedented injuries, unprecedented all-star players going down in the regular season, in the playoffs. And we haven't even gotten to the conference finals, for God's yeah. sakes. Yeah. You know, so That's you why can, it's been so fun the past you, 24 you can hours. expect it, you know, and I mean, it's just like this crazy day where there's so much news happening that that Lakers fast break decides they ought to have a podcast about it. Absolutely. Um, you know, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's it's sort of like Donald Trump being president and you being in the news industry, you know, because that's like the best thing that could happen to the news industry. And for all of these talk shows. For websites like Lakerholics.com and for podcasts like Lakers Fast Break, you know, this is nothing but low hanging fruit yeah, being dropped we, in our hands, you know. As much um, as we like to say, you know, yeah. I agree with you because, in fact, CNBC, CNN, and Fox would all say, you know, they would like a different president to be a place just because the I ratings were <laughs> so much higher with for all three of those networks during that individual's time period it's, you know now that you know there's something somebody different plays people take a exhale they go ahead and now they can do other things with their lives instead of being glued to the television every single time so i get it i get it uh, and i understand that but uh you know whatever your political things uh lie is the nba you know, you is a traffic accident right yeah. now it's like exactly. a race car accident so it's organized <laughs> chaos and i love it i love it but <laughs> sean speaking of organized chaos we talked about just briefly about what's going on with the Clippers and the Jazz, and that game has gone final. And <laughs> I got to admit it, L. Rob, I got to admit it, Laker Tom, I got to admit it, Magic Man, playoff P with tonight's performance has made up for hitting the side of the backboard in the bubble. It's just one uh, game. Well, th just that was one just game. one game then. Don't, well, go, least... don't go patting him on the back too hard or you'll uh, knock him over. Uh, well, that's true. Well, maybe that's what I'm doing. Maybe that's what I'm doing. But uh, again, a great, great performance. He, you know, obviously he, he just did a great job. He had to step it up because we're not sure what the status is of how it hurt uh, the injury to Kawhi Leonard is. Uh, there, it is a ACL injury of some type. The team has not expressed to what extent. Uh, I know when it concerns the issue about swelling. Uh, the, so obviously there's there's some concern that this could be a very serious injury. Looking at him being out the rest of the series, if not longer, but Paul George did step it up tonight. Thirty-seven points, sixteen rebounds, a crucial block shot of Donovan Mitchell in the last minute on a three-point attempt. And uh, you know what? 
They win 119-111, take a, a three games to two lead, heading back to L.A. Your thoughts, Magic Man, on this performance? Uh, yeah, Gerald. Um, when I saw the the news about Kawhi, um, I was with my girlfriend at the time, and I happened to pull my phone over to her, and her being a physical therapist and having worked with uh, – some of the Toronto Raptors from 2019, she just shook her head like this. I said, what's going on? She said the following. She said, Sean, Kawhi Leonard was the oldest 27 year old that my friends ever worked on. (laughs) And the San Antonio Spurs will probably tell you that Kawhi was the oldest 26 year old that they ever worked on. Kawhi has bilateral tendinopathy. It's a chronic knee condition. It's unfortunate, but he's got problems in both of his knees. In his right knee, he has patellar tendinopathy. In his left knee, he has, I believe it is quad tendinopathy. It's a very difficult injury. If this is an ACL, it's serious. And while playoff did make up for uh, that back, I feel he made up for it tonight, Gerald, his performance. However, if he doesn't close the deal in game six, then he might have to deal with pandemic P again in game seven. And um, I think this is a case of the Clippers where they might have won the battle, but I think they've lost the war overall because if they're going to go to the finals, you can't plant your flag and run without Kawhi and think you're going to win. It's just not yeah. the card. Going up against that backcourt, you saw how well they matched up with the Lakers. And the Lakers, again, had they been healthy, I still think they would have pulled out the series. But, uh, you know, neither here nor there. The Suns now, but we'll talk about the Suns in a second because they have an issue that needs to be brought up. But L. Rob. Your thoughts on tonight's game? The Clippers now take a three to two games lead. Yeah, I'm, to me, in many ways, it does make up for that. You know, I guess effort and time and, and the choke that he did last year when we were all saying, you know, and all laughing and all having a good time over the Clippers at that point. So we're all we're all glad that uh, you know it's not going to be uh, you know the same way. I guess for the Clippers, but. I'm going to say this, L. Rob. I mean, you got to give it to Paul George. He picked up the pace tonight. Even if they get by the Jazz, I don't give them much of a chance against Phoenix, regardless of the status of Chris Paul. But your thoughts on playoff P and how well yeah. he did tonight? You know what? Uh, you have to give him credit, man. He came out and he pretty much uh, controlled the game. He um, was the best player on the court from, for, for 48 minutes. So. Uh, you got to tip your hat. What do you have? 37, 15, something like that. So yep. that's, a, that's a great game. That's what you need. Shot a great percentage. Um, yeah, I mean, that was a, a great performance. Uh, and you, you give Paul George credit. And I've always, you know, I always like Paul George until, you know, until I've seen him partying with Westbrook and after telling us how much he wanted to come to L.A. So since then, I don't have a strong dislike for him. I just don't think, you know, when you don't want to come to the Lakers, uh, you know, I have to feel some kind of way. Like you don't want that pressure. You don't want that, you don't need that smoke. So um, good to see him come up big. Um, like you said, though, like Tom and and, and and Sean said, this is one game. Same with KD. That was a great game. But uh, going up 3-2 in the conference semifinals don't get you anything. Yeah. So, you know what, you got to back up those games with more games. And you got to end up hoisting the Larry O'Brien. Then we'll give you full credit. Otherwise, we'll say, hey, that was a great run. Um, but I have to go back to that Bucks game. That was, without a doubt, absolutely one of the worst coach games I've ever seen in 50 years of watching basketball. And that was, you got a man out there that's playing like a mummy. And you're guarding him. Oh, that's right. That's right. Because you had not only Harden out there, Shamit's a liability on defense. 
Harden, because of his injuries, was you should have taken him to the yeah. rack each and yeah. every time. Forget the offense. Let Harden shoot. Let him shoot. Let him be aggressive. Yeah. Double yeah. team KD and let leave Harden wide open. Yeah. Can he can he go to the basket? I mean, can he drive? Can he did he make what he made? One basket? One out of you ten. Him like he's Kobe Bryant in his prime. You got Drew Howard. You're wasting one of your best defensive players. Garden, garden, a guy who can barely move, who showed no interest in really trying to score, who was yep. just a decoy before, and you never switched your strategy. That was, that and he was, was out there forty six minutes. He was out there forty six minutes alongside KD. Just yeah, that okay. that was mind boggling. And yeah. somewhere in the course of all this stuff, I, you know, I what I would love to see, I would love to see Rick Carlisle say, you know what, all this drama that's going on in Dallas. You know, if it's true that this analytics guy is calling the shots, um, let me out of here and 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 Budenhauser get fired. Let Rick Carlisle go to Milwaukee. They will win a championship. He will lead that team to a championship if he goes to Milwaukee. So I would like to see them have a real coach, man. They got guys who he looks baffled on the sidelines. You got your best player out there telling us that Kevin Durant is the greatest player in the world. It's like somebody needs to talk to him and tell him you never say that. Even if you think KD is good, what Giannis in the post game is saying Kevin Durant's the best player in the world. What is this? What's going on over there? But well, doubling him yeah, again I, I would have, have been a smart say, move. Yeah, I have Go to ahead. say he's yeah, I have to say, Gerald, um, I agree with Lee and 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 Tom there. He's you know, Giannis. Uh, aspired and does aspire to be like Kobe, but he's like reverted away from the Mamba mentality these past two playoffs. With you can't have the Mamba mentality. mentality if you can't shoot. <laughs> yeah, well, it, Kobe Kobe once said, "If you can't shoot, it doesn't matter if you go go right or left." <laughs> um, you know, Chris Middleton made an incredible basketball play yesterday. And all Giannis had to do was put it up off the glass. He didn't even right. need to go strong after it. Yeah. But right. Butterfingers dropped yeah, it. Yeah, but Chris Middleton, you a scorer. Score that. You're right at the rack. Also true. Well, Chris Middleton, a lot also is asked true. of him. The thing is, with because the unique play and the unique style of their star peer, player, Giannis Antetokounmpo, and what he does and what he brings, the only thing that he really cannot bring you is that that individual that down the stretch is going to get you those clutch baskets or you can count on it. It just seems he can get a lot of extra stuff extraneous from the outside as far as maybe putting in putback dunks or giving you a key block here or something like that. It's he's not the individual that Milwaukee can lean on in the last two minutes of any type of important game. Who do they always lean on? Chris Middleton. Chris Middleton is a good player, a very good player, an all-star, but he is not a superstar. And time and time again, so much is put on him. He would be perfect as a number two guy. And technically in Milwaukee, he is. But for some reason, always down the stretch, they play him like he's a number one. And the problem is he is not a number one. He's a number two guy. He would be the guy that, let's say, on the, on our team in the Lakers, the LeBron, okay, they double-team LeBron. You kick it out to Middleton for the easy three. That's the type of guy, that's the type of player he should be. be he should be. But the problem is it, with Milwaukee, Budenholzer says, okay, I need you to isolate Middleton. I need you to take it, and I need you to make all the decisions with the ball. And the problem is he's not – that type of player. But then again, we could go all day on Budaholzer's mistakes. And you know what? If they end up losing in the series, I don't think you'll be able to see Budenholzer in the job in much longer than that because, you know, there's a lot of firings going on right now in the NBA. And we'll cover that here in a few minutes. But also here today to talk about what's going on with the major news all over the place is a good man indeed. He is part of five things at Lakerholics.com. It is Jamie Sweet. Jamie, before we head on to the news, I want to go ahead and hit you up as far as anything you saw with the Clippers going up 3-2, Atlanta going up 3-2, and Brooklyn going up 3-2 before we head on to the major news stories involving Phoenix, the coaching changes, Dallas and their front e front office, you know, chaos, and so much more. I'll try to nutshell it pretty quickly. 
Milwaukee has three number twos, and they rely on their defense to be number one. Neither Holiday, Giannis, or Chris are number one guys on any team. They're all at best number twos in terms of the way they play the game, the way they attack the game. Uh, Trey Young is for real. Uh, he's going to go farther than uh, – he might go farther than Luka Doncic has ever managed to go. That battle between who was the better number one pick that uh, that draft was – I'm not always, willing to go there yet. I'm willing to go there. Uh, I, I'm willing to go there. I'm willing to go there, dude. I don't know <laughs> that either – well, let's look who's left. Is 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 Philly going to really be able to come back? Is it, what does Embiid had a great game, but like the Bucks, oh, I'm sorry, the Hawks have enough firepower to out fight. Like Philly's defense has to improve far beyond what they've shown us that they're willing to com- commit to here in the playoffs. Is if Danny Green's loss that big of a deal? I think it is. I think Danny Green was essential yeah, in us I winning the championship last season. I, I mean, everybody wants to be like, oh, he doesn't he doesn't shoot like 40-plus percent from three every season. Like, the dude plays great, great communicative team defense. He was one of the guys that was one of the key cogs in our championship defense last season. Uh, and I don't – that defense is somewhere where you can get away with guys with a little less athleticism if everybody is, like, on the same page. If you know where you're trying to move guys, you can get a step that you don't get with athleticism with smarts, but it takes everybody. Uh, we didn't have that at the in the playoffs this season, and we didn't have a lot of athleticism, even though we had a well-rated defense that wasn't performing as advertised at that point, which I think we all are in agreement for. Um, uh, listen, I think Trey Young knows how to make everybody on that team better the way Magic Johnson knew how, knew how to make everybody better on teams before he was a prolific scorer. Uh, in a way that everybody kind of expects Ben Simmons to be able to do, uh, but in the modern NBA, I don't think – if Magic Johnson was a rookie today, I, I think he would struggle to play, right? Like, he didn't have a three-point shot. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. It would take somebody who – We're on a hot take. This is a hot take podcast. That's I, know, I know, I know. The only reason I say that, there's only one reason I say that, is because there is so much more outside pressure from the world than when Magic came up. Uh, to be a type of point guard, to be a type of player, to fit into a type of role on a team that does not always translate into winning, but translates into numbers, into raw stats, into numbers that are bloated in many, especially in the regular season. And the contributions and the style that Magic played, uh, you know, I take that back in a way because LaMelo Ball did just win Rookie of the Year, and he has a game that is very reminiscent, I think, of a Magic Johnson. And so... I'm going to check myself a little bit. Uh, I think that Magic would struggle to succeed at the level that he did as a professional because he didn't come into the league with a three-point shot. The way that Ben Simmons has, and he didn't have he didn't have the athleticism and quickness that Ben Simmons has, right? Like Magic was as much a cerebral player as a young man that ever came into the league, maybe ever, right? That like the way he saw the game as a chess match. I, it'd be, I would love to see it. I would love to see it. I, that's one of the things about the NBA, right? It's like you say this or that about this guy, and I'm a huge Magic Johnson fan. I, I've met Magic Johnson, and I don't have any pictures with him, but he's you know, he's a very nice man. Pretty terrible GM, pretty terrible president, pretty terrible coach. Uh, but anyway, I just think Trey Young's for real. I feel like he's blowing up in a way that Ben Simmons will never blow up because Ben Simmons can't shoot. <laughs> Because now, Gian- now I'll because say Giannis this can't though. shoot. The guys who can't shoot in this league are never going to be, and LeBron proved that by learning to shoot. You can't come into the league and be a dominating superstar of the modern NBA uh, in a way you have to, or you have to be like Jordan esque, right? You have to score and assist and re- like Russell Westbrook, but even he's vilified, right? Like, uh, that's what I guess I'm saying is that there's so much outward pressure from the world to be a type of NBA player that fits into an analytical mold that makes every, you know, and a lot of those things don't translate into playoff basketball. I don't think anybody saw the Hawks going this far and it's a tribute to their competitiveness. The only thing I'll say is L Rob hit it on the, on the nose as far as the coaching job by doc rivers. One thing I do want to say is, in a playoff matchup, you got to exploit weaknesses. And for all the great things Trey Young does on the offensive side, he is a major liability still on the defensive side. And I have not seen 
Philadelphia take major advantage of that? And that's, I think, another key problem with this as well. Well, that's why Ben Simmons will never live up to the Magic Johnson label because he doesn't have that also. Like I say, Magic was a cerebral player, but he was also somebody who wanted to win more than anything else on planet Earth. Uh, and I don't see that same fire in Ben Simmons. Uh, I actually see that fire a little more in Embiid, but his body, his body betrays him like Brandon Roy. Um, I love Ben Simmons' game. I think he would actually be a great Laker. Uh, but um, if Embiid isn't going to be able to carry that team the way that they need him to, and he like it's Embiid versus Young at this point, right? Like it's it's. You know that's 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 the that's the kung fu matchup, man. It's Embiid versus Young, big versus little, outside versus everywhere for Embiid. You know they both can score everywhere. They both the difference is that Trey Young makes his team better uh, than Embiid does, uh, which is in theory Ben Simmons's job, but it's not too. It's just not working that way. I, I think I think Trey Young's too much for both Ben Simmons and Embiid to overcome as a team in the playoffs. At least the way they play nowadays. Too much for the process. Yeah. <laughs> Too much right. for the process. Man, I, you should have been. Hey, why did Hinky leave in the first place? Because the league wanted him out. But you know what? It seems like ever since then, they've been making mistakes in Philly just despite themselves. And I think Hinky should have stayed in place. But that, that's just my opinion on that one. But again, the process is still going on, could still go on. But we'll see what happens this weekend for Philadelphia and Atlanta. Once again, Atlanta's up three games to two. Also as well, the Clippers are up three games to two as that hits back to Los Angeles. And Brooklyn is up three games to two in that series. But there's one series that is finished, and that is Phoenix that did finish off, did the uh, did the old sweep on Denver in a series. Again, which makes me long for the fact that I wish I, we had two healthy Lakers. But again, that's going to dwell on that as much as I can. But Laker Tom, there's some news that came down today in regards to Chris Paul, and he tested positive. It's funny because afterwards, Sham Sharania said out of the eligible over 100 players that are still left in the playoffs, <laughs> only one only tested one. positive. Ah, and everybody's like on Twitter, I wonder who that was. Right. Hmm, hmm. But right now he is in, in uh, COVID protocol. Supposedly, he did vaccinate himself. So if he is asymptomatic, and he tests negative two days in a row. I believe that's the, that's the deal. He gets the you know get out of jail free card, and he gets to go ahead and you know play if they are going to play because you know it could the series could start as early as Sunday or it could start Tuesday, Wednesday, could even start later than that. So we'll see. Yeah, I know, Jamie. Bubble playoffs, zero positive tests. But then again, that was in, in such a confined environment and all that. You saw after they finished off the series. Chris Paul went to the stands. He was hugging family members and things of that nature. He said, you're not sure what happens, what then? And, you know, I'm not going to say that did it, but you know, you, you never know during the course of what he walked into the locker room, somebody coughed along the way or you know, just somebody random. He goes to the store. I mean, it could happen to anyone at any point in time right now. Now that we are more open, less people are wearing masks, et cetera, et cetera. So, Laker Tom, I want to hear your thoughts on this with Chris Paul. If he, if you think he's going to be out, and what would that do for Phoenix against the Clippers or Utah? Um, I don't think he's going to be out. I mean, it would have to be one of those rare cases, you know, ten percent, uh, because the vaccines have proven to be close to ninety percent, presuming that he got vaccinated early before the Johnson single dose was available. So if he got the Pfizer or the Moderna. Uh, vaccine, it would be, you know, it's a 10 to one shot that he actually caught anything. Um, on the other hand, uh, you know, if you test positive, it has to mean something, yeah. you know. Um, well, that, and, he is, if that's the case, he would be listed as a breakthrough individual, right. uh, <laughs> meaning most likely he will not suffer. Yeah, any but there are, the problem issues. is there are a lot of false positives that, that yeah. happen out there. So you can't really rely on that test. It's, it's why they have the two two negative tests would override that. Well, so, at least they have some know, time for him to figure yeah. it out. Uh, you know, so I think, I think it'll be fine. You know, I, I think it's possible that, you know, I mean, if he has COVID, um, and that's going to hurt the Suns. But, you know, I, I tell you, one of the guys that impressed me more than almost anybody else on that team was Cameron Payne. Um, 
you know, you look at the guys like uh, Ross and uh, like Payne who come out of nowhere, you know, and all of a sudden are playing and he has a quickness to him um, that that's really difficult to contain. He gets to the rim as well, maybe even better than a guy like Schroeder. Um, and he can shoot the three. He shoots off balance. He's got more of a set shot, you know, like Schroeder does. But at least it's a quick, it's a quick moving shot. So yeah, we're, you know, this is this is, in my opinion, we had the bubble playoffs, the bubble championship. This is the the bubble tax or the bubble penalty championship because of all of the people that are injured out there. Um, and as it's as we look at the teams that are remaining and the teams that are likely to win the championships. It's going to be very difficult for any team to go in there fully, fully healthy, you know, for the championship. I mean, Donovan Mitchell is not, was not Donovan Mitchell tonight. Um, and I know they kept giving excuses for it, but man, he bricked a couple of threes uh, that were just wide open threes that you'd normally expect him to have a good chance to make. Um, so every single team out there has an issue with a player uh, that they're missing, that that is a valuable part of the valuable cog in their machines. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see who's going to win the championship this year. You know, um, as a Laker fan, uh, I enjoy watching all of the games. Um, I'm obviously rooting for, uh, unlike almost every other sport, well, I'll root for the team that took out my team. Um, I'm probably rooting for the Suns. Um, I only have a couple of exceptions for that. I once rooted for the Boston Red Sox when the Yankees got taken out. Um, I will never root for the Los Angeles Clippers if, if uh, even though they're from the Western Conference. Um, and uh, there are some exceptions like the Boston Celtics and, and the East that I just won't root for because they're nice. that's just the way I'm built. But uh, I, I, th I think I think the, I think the Suns will be okay. Um, this is one of those this is one of those seasons, you know, like there was an advantage that you had in the bubble for guys not having to play in front of crowds on the road. And you saw some guys shoot lights out for doing that. Um, now we're playing with fans on the road, but the teams that have continuity, you know, and, and we're primarily talking about Utah and, and Phoenix, <clears throat> everybody devalued their finishing first and second, uh, thinking that the Clippers and the Lakers were the better teams. Um What's what stood out to me in these playoffs, I think, is that uh, they both, they probably deserve that first and second rating, and the continuity that they have is is what's held them through the first two rounds of the playoffs. Uh, the Suns have proven that they can take care of business. You know, they took down a Lakers team that, even though they were hobbled, uh, is the defending champion, and it takes a certain amount of of uh, pride and the desire to do that. It's something that I think you can easily not give the proper value to. So I think that they deserve a lot of credit for how they played against the Lakers. Um, I think they deserve credit and how they played in the second round. They're the only team that's sitting out there waiting for their opponent to be decided. And uh, they're the team that I think may have a shot to win it all. You know, it, it just depends what happens with the injuries on teams coming from the East and, um, you know, whether or not the teams that are going to win in the West, uh, whether or not the Clippers can probably get Kawhi back. Um, now, if uh, if they lose CP3 because he ends up having COVID or something like that, comes back with a second positive test, um, that'll hurt them. But uh, it wouldn't hurt them as much as, let's say, the Nets losing uh, Kyrie, Kyrie and, uh, and Harden. Uh, or as much as the the 76ers losing losing uh, Embiid, so you know it's it's Chris is more of a guy who's given them confidence through the year, but I think what he's brought to that team is not going to disappear if he's not playing. Well, I'll tell you what, it's going to be very interesting to see how this plays out. Again, he needs to get two negative tests in a row to get back to get cleared. Will that happen before the start of the next round of the M? At the Western Conference Finals, we'll wait and see. But again, Chris Paul is currently under protocol. We'll have to wait and see what they'll do as far as that. And hopefully he'll feel better. 
because I don't wish any ill will on Chris Paul, Chris Paul because you know obviously he's a he's a great player. He's been Might be Laker next well. year. You never know. You never know. You never know. Nothing is out of bounds at this point. But we'll talk about all the trade targets or targets that the Lakers should go ahead after coming up on our show on Monday because of the fact we've got so much to talk about. We thought we'd come on a little bit early and talk about all the great news. But Magic Man, you're up center right now because we're going to be talking about the Dallas front mess, uh, the, the front the mess in the Dallas front office right now because I'll tell you what, it's been something very interesting to see over the course of the past 48 hours. The Athletic, not Tim McMahon of ESPN, who is the vaunted Mr. Texas reporter that was supposed to get all this news. It was The Athletic doing some really investigative journalism. And as a fellow journalism major and graduate, I really just truly appreciate the work that they did on it because they've been, they, they found out that there's been a lot of tension behind the scenes in the Dallas Mavericks organization really stemming from what I guess the, the issues between Luka Doncic, who you really don't want to get upset if you really want to hold on to him long term because he's on the verge of signing a mega contract here in the not too distant future. And the director of the quantitative director of quantitative research and development, her uh, Haralabos Vulgaris, Haralabos Vulgaris who, if you're not familiar with him, is a major individual out in the gambling scene. But he uses a lot of analytics in the way he goes and does about his business. He's become very successful as a gambler based off of analytics and has transferred that information at the behest of Mark Cuban to the Dallas Mavericks organization over the past couple of years. But over that time, he's built a lot of tension with Luca. And I think because of the fact that the numbers say one thing and Luca is saying another, I think it's pretty much what it comes down to. And they have not been playing very nice, nice. And I guess this whole blow up and this whole tension has led to the, I guess, res resignation of uh, VP of the front office and a guy who's been with the team over 20 years and Donnie Nelson, who I think all of us can say we have, a, we have hold held, we have held in high regards. He even helped, navigate for a, a team that won a world championship he helped get luca and made that trade to get luca into dallas he also i think was part of the individual the the group that helped draft dirk nowitzki i mean just truly been a part of a, that organization and to see him out over all this mess has been really unfortunate very unfortunate very sad gerald um I have great admiration for this man's father. Um, he's basically one of the coaches I grew up watching and coaching and learning the game of basketball from, and that's the great Don Nelson. Um, as far as Donnie's concerned, I mean, my goodness, you think about working at a job for 23 years in 2021. Just imagine asking a millennial or a Gen Zer, yeah, you know what? You're going to spend 23 years at this job. I guarantee you 99 out of 100 will say, all right, whatever. 23 years is a long time. And, Gerald, it, it seems like there's been this friction. From It almost feels like it's a fracking. It, there's fracking going on with the Dallas Mavericks with uh, these small tremors and earthquakes going on. Um, I agree with you. Um, it looks like Cuban is really adopting the model of the Tampa, Tampa Bay Rays ownership. And those guys were from Wall Street. And you talked about the gambling expert that he has. Look, a lot of these guys get in a room with these owners, these math nerds, and they basically convinced them a way to run an organization or club that really hasn't been done before. They're so convinced and they're so enthusiastic about their their package they wrapped up and put a nice bow on for you. They convince you that what they're selling is real. And like you said, Gerald, it looks like it's a battle between the math nerds and Luca's feel for the game. Now, when Luca talks about a feel for the game, 
I know exactly what he's talking about because Magic talked about that all the time. He would say, yep, yeah, we'd go into film study, we'd all understand what we had to do, but five to eight minutes into the ball game, the, the game plan went to put. There's foul trouble, somebody got injured. So Magic, when the game plan didn't work, I went right to Pat Riley. He said, oh, Pat, I'm going to feel my way out of this. And Riley would say, yeah, go for it, within reason. And it just seems like Carlisle is, I don't think he's resisting Luka at all. I think it's a more of a push and pull. And obviously now we see Carlisle's been pressured into using lineups, into using players that he doesn't really think will give him uh, a matchup advantage. And um, I kind of agree with Lee. I think if Bud is fired, it makes it really easy for Rick Carlisle to say, bye-bye, check, please. I'm going to resign. And Milwaukee would hire him in a, in a New York hot minute, like Lee said. And that's something I will talk about with l Rob here in a second, because l Rob, I mean, you see the mess that's going on in Dallas right now. There's going to be a front office change, and all this comes over, I guess, the friction between, again, the quantitative research and development head, Haralabos Volgaris and Luka Doncic. To me, if I'm Mark Cuban, I would have headed this off in the past, but this is not the first, I guess, inner office scandal that they've had in within the past three, four years there. For, for someone who everybody sees on the outside thinks they've got their stuff straight in, in regards to Mark Cuban, I think more than meets the eye, if that's concerned, because we've already seen it now once, I think twice. This is, I think, the third office scandal that they've had of some type in the past three, four years. Yeah. Um, yeah, you got to give Cuban first a lot of credit because he took over an organization that was uh, in, in disarray, and he's made them one of the better, best franchises in the league. So, yeah, he's, he's proven to be a great owner. And... Um, you know, he got them there on plane and different things he did to really make it player friendly. But it does seem like based on the last, you know, several years, there's always something going on in the Maverick organization that uh, gives them a black eye. So it's the buck stops at him. Just watching Carlisle coach and how much he just gave over the team to Luca, just that's not the Rick Carlisle I know. I mean, and and I just couldn't put my finger in. I was like, well, you know, I mean, Luca is great, no doubt about it. But it just seemed like something was fishy with that. So now, when all this coming out, I'm sure, yeah, I'm starting to think maybe that they were kind of told, hey, treat Luca with kid gloves, let him do whatever he wants, and let him kind of run things. And you know, I, it's kind of hard to argue with that. But before we go too much further, I have to go back to address Jamie's point about the great. Great Magic Johnson being, um, I remember the very first game that Magic played in Big Ten, and he was playing up, he was playing against uh, University of Minnesota. At the time, they had Kevin McHale, and they had Michael Thompson. Michael Thompson was a senior. He was All-American. As you guys know, he would be, go on to be the number one pick in the draft the following year. So he's a senior. And one of the best NBA color commentators out there. There you go. And they were the defending champs. So, it's a tight game, second half. You know, Magic's a freshman. You know, Michael Thompson's a senior. They got this experienced team. And, um, you know, they pack it in on, on, on Magic. And Magic pulls up, and, and, you know, the knock is he can't shoot. He comes down. He is back-to-back -back, um, bank shots from about 18 feet. Um, and it's basically Magic was going to do whatever it took to win the game. Some like if he if you gave him an outside shot, he was gonna take it, and he, and he wasn't he was never scared of the moment. So you know a guy like um, Simmons, you know you can see he shies away from the moment. Magic embraced the moment, you know. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's uh, I, 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 it pains me to hear people even compare somebody like him to Magic, but I it, I definitely see Trey having that type of impact. Um, you know he having an impact and the control similar to a Magic Johnson, but I mean. He's a little dude. He's six one. I mean, Magic <laughs> is boards, pushing it down. I mean, people. We got this image somehow, kind of like people have a Kareem now of the old Kareem when he, you know, thirty five and thirty eight and forty years old. But people don't. I mean, a young Magic, a young Magic will swell, grabbing rebounds, 
pushing it down team's throat. And it was just probably the most amazing basketball any of us will ever see. It, uh, magic and prime, like, and you know, I'm not talking about magic when he balked up and was going to the post hitting the baby sky hook. I'm talking about young magic at 22, 23, 24 years old. That was incredible. So I had to get that out. Um, now back to the Dallas organization. Yeah, it is. Uh, and I agree with you about Kareem. Kareem, young Kareem, unstoppable, amazing, a threat from all over the court. Like, yeah, yeah. And so, um. I do have to say this about Laker time. You probably enjoyed this. This is the first time I've seen this. Utah, 70% of their shots today was from three-point. You take 80 shots in the game, and 54 of them are from three-point land. Is this the basketball we want to see? I mean, I guess it's supposed to be winning basketball, but, I mean, my goodness, I see Chris Paul dominating, shooting mid-range shots. I see Book getting into the lane, shooting mid mid-range shot. I see KD shooting mid-range shots. You know, these teams that just want to live and die by the three, I don't like, I, that's not a formula for winning. That is not. And uh, you know what, as much as it pains me to see and uh, the Clippers win, you know what, I, I don't want to see Utah win playing like that. I don't. So, you know, somebody else will have to take care of the Clippers. If you want to shoot 70% 70, 70 of your shots from three points, get out of here. I want to see you gone. Carl Malone's rolling in his uh, in his uh, Hemi right now. Yeah, so. something like that. But oh, yes, a lot of stuff going on in the NBA. But before we head on out, Jamie, I'm going to head it to you with one last subject to talk about, and that is another firing. And that <laughs> was Stan Van Gundy, the second coach this so far this offseason that has been fired after only one season. Did a terrible job with a somewhat talented nucleus in New Orleans. Didn't even make the playoffs. Didn't even make the plan. And was rewarded for his troubles with the early ouster. Your thoughts on it? Was it well-deserved? I still think a lot of it, I, I, I'm in agreement with what I heard over, I think it was either podcast or NBA radio, putting a lot of it on David Griffin. And I do put a lot of it on David Griffin for some of the things that he did as far as making this a talented but very uh, non well fitting roster i think the the pieces are, it's like it's like a beautiful puzzle and not all the pieces fit yeah i thought he gave stan van gundy a bad puzzle uh but he's not going to fire himself so <laughs> yeah. so that's so that's how that works in the nba I, coaches are always the first to take the fall on any team that performs uh, below or you know blows it or you know if you don't meet expectations which i think if he had simply made the play in he'd still be coaching uh, the pelicans today um I, I, and i don't think stan's the right coach for a modern nba team i think both van gundy brothers are a little too uh too legit to quit like they're they're gonna like tell it to you how it is and they're not gonna be like hey man you remember yesterday when like that guy blew by blue, blue, blue on defense. Let's get better at that. You know what I mean? Like, if you don't kind of, like, give him a little bit of a hug with the message, like, it's not going to get – I think that's the great thing about Vogel. Like, we give Vogel a, a, a deserved, you know, critique. But he is able to make young players like Kuz and THT buy into defense, right? Like, that's not an easy thing to do in the modern NBA. No matter how, no matter the result, like that is a tangible reality that he's gotten young players who traditionally are like, well, but I want to score 20 points or yeah, but I want the ball a lot or whatever. Uh, and I think also that, that they needed to, uh, they need to play Zion. Like if Stan Van Gundy was going to be the coach, he should have ran every set from the Dwight NBA finals year with like Rashard Lewis at like four, the OG four out before D'Antoni even was like Dwight operate the center and throw four guys out on the perimeter. And, you know, it did work against Kobe and Phil and Powell and Lamar and Bynum and Trevor Ariza. But I, you know, it would have, I think, gotten the Pelicans to the playoffs this year. Like they played a, a weird brand of basketball that never really seemed to maximize any individual player's strength. And try to be like, but Brandon and Zion and Lonzo a little bit, and oh look, even Josh Hart. Like, pick a guy. 
Well, pick a guy. Ingram, pick a guy. Build the, build the, the team around that, that team. He should. And yeah, he should. Ingram, Ingram thinks he's a closer on that team. And he should that, be on a team. That's what. That's what their he, issue is. Zion yeah. is supposed to be the man on that team. Then, right. But right. Ingram thinks he's the closer. Right. So I think. Ingram is going to get traded at some point within the next, I'd say, this calendar year, either next off season, or I would say, you know, at the trade deadline, maybe in two years. But you're right, Jamie. If it's a mishmash of a lot of different elements, like signing Stephen Adams, it's like trading for Adams. It's terrible move. Extent, terrible move. A little right. Strange. Yeah. Uh, it took away two guys all of... that can't shoot to three. Right. You're not right. going to win in the modern modern NBA. And, and you gave Adams yeah. a big fat contract on top. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I mean the problem is David Griffin. Yes, exactly. Everybody agrees. David, David Griffin, but David's not going to fire himself, right? Like it's a, yeah. no. So Stan. <laughs> but I'll well, tell you Stan, what. Stan who wants? wouldn't play the young players? That's his problem. Yeah, he wanted to win. I mean, yeah, but he didn't win. That's the problem. Yeah. And he won. That's the problem. I want to know who steps into that. We're all talking about, oh, like Carlisle could easily step into Milwaukee. And I think, like, I'm not going to lie. I, I feel like L. Rob has some sort of Rick Kyle, Carlisle crystal ball that he just, like, I, I was, as soon as he said it, I was like, oh, yeah, that's like his team. No, isn't he it? does. Like, you know, his, his, yeah. his point. The point that that point that uh, Lee made about Carlisle's involvement in this situation and totally. the possible conflict between Carlisle and giving the green light totally to Luca as the superstar on the team, um, and it's kind of interesting because I also heard I, I saw on Twitter and I haven't seen this confirmed anywhere that uh, the analytics guy's also gone, and Carlisle's probably gone. Right. I mean, this yeah. is like a total disaster. Right. Well, and let me ask and, you this. Uh, well, hold on. Let me ask you this, Laker Tom. I'll give this question to you. I was going to ask Elrob this. In fact, we'll ask all each and every one of you guys real quick. Start with you, Laker Tom, and then we'll get right back to you with what you're doing for Lakerholics.com. Is the New Orleans Pelicans the stop, best stop of all these vacancies? And we're going to include Milwaukee. If Milwaukee chokes it and we think Budenholzer is gone, where is the best spot, do you think, right now? You know, I think I think also, a tough too, there's a possibility there may be an opening in Philadelphia. Well, you're moment. talking about the Blazers, the Bucks, the yeah. Pelicans, the Magic. I don't think they'll fire Doc, I, even even if he chokes it. I don't and know. The, I, I, actually, I actually think the best job could be Luka. And the Wizards. The best job could be Luka. Because you got to remember, if they fire Doc, they'll have two coaches on the payroll. Right, and no, they'll have really, to get a third. Yeah, well, it's right. just like luxury tax. If you want to win, you do it. Yeah. Or is, was Brett Brown or like the, the last year? Not renewed. <laughs> I'm not sure. I, I think Brett Brown had one at least one more year on his contract. Right. I, I didn't say Doc. I said the Bucks. Uh, oh no, I but think, I meant I think, if Philadelphia goes, if Philadelphia goes, I don't uh, know. I, I think they, they look at the I, think I, think, I think they'll keep Doc. I think they'll keep Doc. Yeah. Who's I, the I next big superstar? Who do you think is the next big superstar? Trey Young. Luka Doncic. Uh, oh, that's, an, I, that's another I podcast mean, for another day. That's another podcast I, for another day. But go ahead, Sean. That's go where ahead, you Sean. go. You go where the yeah, superstar I, is. Go I ahead, Sean. I was going to say this. I, if, if, if New Orleans buckles down here and identifies a young, up-and-coming assistant coach, I think you could find the right mix to blend with the, this young group. This is going to be Zion Williamson's third coach in his third year. His third coach in his third year. This is but the they are going to win in the West for five more years. To. And you have to make sure that his player development is on a level that meets your expectations. And a third coach in third year isn't isn't close to what you want. So you need stability here. And you've identified the players that Zion like that you can build around. But until you trade Brandon Ingram, who just thinks he's the closer, 
it's going to be a constant battle between him and Zion. But of all the plays in the NBA, team. which which one, if you're a coach that can get any job right now, and we're going to include Milwaukee, if, again, Budenholzer does that, actually does a choke job and fin- it gets finished off by – you know, the Brooklyn uh, Nets and whatnot. But let me ask you, which job is most tantalizing to you? The best job, I think, is the New Orleans job. And the worst job I think you could take right now um, would be Portland. Wow. Because I would have chosen Orlando, but that's just me. Uh, okay, see. <laughs> okay. No, okay, has so got a good, a good right, well, 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 sorry, Washington. Washington. Yeah. yeah, he was Washington, from Oakland. Right, I, I would have probably said, uh, you know, myself, Orlando's the worst job about it's all a, of this. It's a toss up between yeah. them. They're going to be rebuilding jobs. So, yes, forever. But, L Rob, if there was a team, <laughs> let's say you're a coach out there and you're the hottest name out there and you can get any one of these jobs and we'll throw Milwaukee into the mix, which yeah. would you think is the best opportunity? Well, I like what Tom said. You always go with a superstar, superstar here. So if a team got a superstar, then they're in the running. Um, but it's really, it really kind of depends on: Do you want the pressure? Um, do you want to have a team where they're at the bottom, where you can be a fixer upper and build them up, uh, a la Larry Brown? Or do you want to get into a house that's already ready made and you just need to tweak it? Um, there's going to be a lot more pressure in that uh, latter scenario. So it depends on your, you know, um, it really to me is between Dallas and Milwaukee because you got Luka and you got uh, Giannis. Those are clearly the, the two superstars. I wouldn't take a job in, um, I mean, New Orleans is good and Zion has that potential, but that organization is in such a array. You know, you come in and, and things don't go well. Next thing you know, ownership want, want to get rid of Griffin as well. They should. He never should have fired. Um, he never should have. Um, um, I don't. I don't think it warranted firing the previous coach. That you know, Zion oh, was train. hurt. Yeah, yeah, Alan yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Zion was hurt. What was he on minute restrictions? Mm-hmm. He played ten yeah. minutes here, three minutes there, and he was out most of the season. When he came back, they actually played pretty. Good, and then they were on the road before COVID hit. And uh, I thought they were on course to kind of make the playoffs. I think they were only like two or three games out. But at any rate, nevertheless, so he keep, brings in Van Gundy, and then he blows him out. So yeah, he he's on a short leash. I wouldn't take a coaching job there, knowing that the GM may be gone because the GM gets blown out. A new GM is going to want to hire his own coach. So Dallas, they just don't have the you know right now their organization is in kind of a flux too. But they got Luca. So, you know, Luca can cover a multitude of sins. Um, then you got Zion, but Zion, I mean, and then you got Giannis. So I would go to Milwaukee. Give me a team with Giannis, who's proven to be a great player, one of the top five in the league. He just needs help in, 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 in teaching him how to win. And if you're a great coach, I think you should be able to uh, figure that out. Um, boy, but Drew Holiday, I mean, we've been talking about everybody else and giving everybody else grief. He has been very, very disappointing to me. And I like Drew. And I thought he would be a difference maker. But some of the, you know, some of the decisions he's making, you know, it seems like guys who are normally not, who are pretty smart players are making dumb decisions. So, I, I mean, I'm kind of, I know I shouldn't always put that on the coach, but man. So, yeah, I would take that. I guess that's my long way of saying Milwaukee is the job. They have a team that, that can be um, a championship team. And if you're a great coach, I would want that pressure. And I would want to coach one of the greatest players in the league. And that's where I would go. Amazing indeed. But again, it's a very, very, very spirited conversation. We couldn't even talk the Lakers because there's so much to go on as far as the NBA news is concerned. But I want to thank so much L. Rob, Laker Tom, Jamie Sweet, and Magic Man for being part of today's broadcast. But before we head out, these guys have got to mention exactly what they're doing at Lakerholics.com. So we'll start first with Laker Tom. Laker Tom, you're back now. You're back in the swing of things. The site is up, which is always good news. And it's ready to go ahead and get there for you for any interaction with any of the guys out there. But what do you have planned for Lakerholics.com? Well, I think that uh, 
I think the biggest decision that's facing the Lakers, and and it's one of the, it's a decision that really cuts through the heart of the whole organization and the future of the Lakers as a team. Um, and that, that's what happens with Andre Drummond. Um, I think we have a conundrum with Drummond that is endangering the future of the Lakers as a championship competitor. Because I think if we waste our MLE, our non-taxpayer MLE of $10 million, $9 million, if we waste that on Drummond by somehow convincing ourselves that even though he had 25 games and he didn't really show that he could do anything other than have a minus 3.4 net rating with uh, with LeBron, uh, with Anthony Davis, um, he's not a rim protector. He's not a low post finisher. He's not a lob finisher. Um, he's a guy who seems to be the one guy always out of position when you have rotating defenses and so forth. And he doesn't stretch the floor. He doesn't provide, you know, he, he, his man just clogs up the lane. And we're talking about using, we have three real assets to go out and improve this team. We have a draft pick. We've got two players under contract, KCP and Kuzma. And we got the $10 million, $9 million non-taxpayer MLE most likely. So you're going to take one of those and you're going to waste it on a player who's a terrible fit as a center. And I think that that is going to be one of the things that I've been pushing for the last couple of weeks, ever since these comments by Frank Vogel and Rob Palenka about uh, how they really believe that the future of the Lakers is to have Andre Drummond at center, which I think is just crazy. Um, I think the Lakers need to get rid of the three starters that they have now that go along with LeBron James and Anthony Davis. They need to move Schroeder in a sign and trade or let him walk. Uh, they need to trade KCP for a volume three point shooter. And they need to replace Andre Drummond with a modern, a modern offensive def and defensive center like Miles Turner, who can shoot the three and protect the rim. Um, there are other options in each of those cases. I like Buddy Heald as, uh, from uh, the Kings as a, the volume three-point shooter to replace KCP. And I think that uh, there's a team, there's a there's a management team that doesn't want to pay for any, does not want to pay for two coaches. And so they're probably going to run, they're probably going to run out with, uh, with uh, Gerald's favorite coach next year. Um, he's and uh, he's the guy. Not my favorite he, coach. He's a guy who, he's a guy who uh, likes, Kyle Kuzma. Um, uh, so it's going to be an interesting, it's going to be an interesting off season because uh, we'll find out whether this whole thing is going to really, the success of the Lakers off season is going to depend on what happens with Andre Drummond. If they buy this fairy tale that they had to admit was a total failure in game six when they benched the guy and didn't play him. If they turn around and, embrace that as the route to becoming a championship contender again and thinking that we didn't learn anything this year because we would have won it all and it was just because of the injuries. Well, I'm telling you, it wasn't just because of the injuries. It was also because of the poor play of the starting lineup that we had out there and at times the poor shooting of a lot of reserves. So, uh, I will say that it's been, you know, Sean's done a great job as blog editor. Uh, the site's been just filling with posts and comments and, and lots of long threads in there. And, you, you know, you just got to – there's been a great – there's been a, just a great series of conversations. Your check um, is in the mail, Sean. Yeah. You know, no, it's, you know, the thing that we try to do at Lakerholics.com that's different than a lot of the other sites is we're not an aggregator. We're not just putting that same news out there and posting a tweet and that that's all we do. We're really, we're really being curating the news for you. We're really making the comments on the news, pointing out the, inter, the, the intricacies of each of these particular issues as they come up and, and creating a lot of conversation where people are agreeing and disagreeing, making their points, defending their positions and so forth. 
and and it's it's what really makes Lakerholics.com unique among all of the sites that all of this interaction that's caused with the comments between the various team of editors we have and all of the fans that come to the site regularly um, and and go to the extra effort to contribute and make a comment and and like or or dislike a post or so forth that's become the main attraction of the site as much as the original content that I write or that that Jamie writes or Sean writes or or Gerald writes or the podcast that we that we constantly do for everybody it's that interaction that you get that's that's like all of a sudden being at a table in the sports bar with three guys who really know what the hell they're talking about, you know? Um, so anyway, I invite everybody. This is a perfect time to find out what's going on at Lakerholics.com. If you're really interested in what's going to happen to the Lakers, for sure be here next Monday uh, to listen to the podcast because we're going to talk about all of the various options that are available to the Lakers and, uh, and what each of us believes is the best path for the team to follow. And you uh, said someone new is joining us. Someone new is joining us. Uh, uh, you suckered someone in. You, you added someone <laughs> to the cult. There you go. No, it's uh, anybody who's uh, watched, who's read. I feel Medium, like you're Tom Cruise now. Anybody <laughs> who's uh, who's a fan of Medium, uh, Spencer's good. Spencer from Basketball University is going to join us on Sunday, and he does a great job. He's uh, he's actually a college student, so he's he's this is not a full time gig for him, but he's. He's got a great site, and uh, he has great insights. He does some really lengthy articles. He's a Lakers fan, lives in the central time zone. Um, I've been trying to get him on for a while, and, and we've talked about you know exchanging some articles that we do in, in, on his site and, and some of them on Lakerholics. Um, but, so he'll be there. So it's, it's, it's going be, to be a fun thing because uh, none of these guys have, have, have had much experience. It's mostly been me in contact with Spencer. And uh, he's younger than all of us, so it'll it'll, it'll be a, it'll give us a it'll give us a little blend for for you know you've got an old fan and me, and you got through all of these other guys who are sort of call them middle aged, if you will. I'm the senior citizen of the group, and uh, we're getting some young blood in there. So um, it'll be fun to to see uh, how Spencer does with all of the other people in the thing. And if you get a chance, go to Basketball University. Uh, and check that out on Medium because uh, he's got some great stories, great insights, and uh, just be ready to read long articles. In Spencer. L. Rob, let me ask you this, L. Rob. How many days do you think it'll be before Tom kicks me, Jamie, and Sean to the curb? <laughs> you guys are. You guys will be on a short leash. So, Spencer, bring 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 the. Bring the pain and uh, give <laughs> give uh, time a reason to uh, make some make some big moves. But uh, sounds like it's going to be interesting uh, uh, time in the uh, Lakerholic site. Like you said, Sean has done a, a, a great job of keeping things hopping. So um, I mean, these very interesting times. It's uh, exciting times if you're a basketball fan. Um, tough times for us for us Lakers, but I mean. You know, after you get rid of the initial pain of that, then you just kind of get back to making fun of other teams in their failures to misery love company. So, <laughs> absolutely, but also, the Clippers. <laughs> yes, but oh catch El, but catch L Rob on Lakerholics.com with all of his great comments. Catch the articles from Laker Tom today at Lakerholics.com. Jamie Sweet, you've got five things coming up, but I also before you pref, I'm going to preface this before you go ahead and tell us everybody, tell everybody out there what you're doing with five five things. Um, how many days do you think before Laker Tom and Spencer get into an argument? Oh, I mean, all Spencer's going to have to do is say that you know there's a three point sh list shooting center that the Lakers should get because of X, Y, or Z. And that'll, <laughs> Andre that'll, Drummond. That would be it. I don't, no, it could be Drummond Adams. Howard McGee. Uh, I mean, all guys, I, all guys we try to get rid of, man. Uh, I, you understand the point I'm making. Mean. He the, could agree. The, he could agree with me that Jared Dudley is not the best fourteenth man in the NBA. I don't know if that would be enough. I think Tom is a is a, that's a playful that's a playful iconic uh, type. Of okay, game. that's just for yeah. me. All right, that's okay. a, that's right. That's exactly that's for one man's benefit. But uh, okay. No, I mean, listen, you know, the Lakers have a big hole to climb. The biggest one being their cap issues uh, with, you know, a lot of salary tied up in 
roughly four to six guys, depending how retirings or opt-outs or what have you is uh, all break. And that's, like you're saying, a story for another time. Uh, it's definitely a changing of the guard of the NBA this season. Uh, one way or another, a team that has not won the NBA championship uh, in a brick ton of time uh, will be uh, holding a trophy up. Uh, you know, it's 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 a bona fide guarantee at this point. <laughs> so that's really exciting, I think, for the NBA. I will add that it's definitely a – it's a tale of two seasons, right? If this were a Dickens novel – it would be a tale of two seasons, one that was interrupted and one, and spread out and one that was played from beginning to end but squished together. Uh, and we've seen a lot of interesting things that are not really normal, uh, I would say, for the NBA in both seasons. Um, so what will really be interesting is if things progress in a normalist trend uh, and we do still respect, uh, you know, masking indoors if you're not feeling great or hell, mask up if you're not feeling great in general, right? Like many countries do it. It's not some sort of crazy mumbo jumbo science. It's that many germs are spread through the air you breathe, uh, which is basically middle age science if you get right down to it. Um, <laughs> Magic Man maybe could back me up on that one. I don't uh, want to catch a cold mm -hmm. and I don't want to catch don't, COVID. <laughs> That's so, what I'm saying. There you go. That's what I'm I don't saying. Who, either, so. who wants to catch a cold? If you do, if you want to stay home from work, you pull the <coughs> merman pop. Merman. I I, I, limit, <laughs> I literally talked to people who have basically said, "I'm never going shopping again wearing a mask." Right, I haven't like, had a cold in a year. The right, hell with like, it. Right. I don't care how stupid I look. I'm sorry. You get to look like a like a bandit, right? With like a cool like if you could make it cool, like. like uh, that's all I'm gonna say. I haven't had a cold in, in. I didn't get a cold in 2020, and I haven't caught a cold yet in 2021. Neither am I. Yeah. So this, it's, a, it's a gold thing conspiracy gonna ruin our society. You wear one. Like, uh, like, it, it, it sounds like it's getting late because Jamie's really going off the deep end. But before we head on out. Sean, new, age I the NBA is, new age for the NBA is all I want to say. Young stars, uh, if Kawhi somehow manages to pull all the way through, he'll be the only one, I, one of the few that's only won an NBA championship before. And, and that's yeah, I, but he's, His knee injury is going to prevent I, him from doing anything I, else. I agree. Yes. Okay. But, Sean, before we head on out, I know you got some great stuff as the blog editor for Lakerholics.com. So tell me your thoughts and what's going on at Lakerholics.com. Uh, Gerald, once again, thank you very much for sharing the platform with uh, with us and myself in general. It's been a real pleasure, and I hope it continues down the road. Sounds like a resignation um, letter. I hope that's not the case. <laughs> <laughs> no, just just a humble thank. To oh, okay. Our, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, Gerald, with all the injuries and um, with distractions and interruptions we've had here, I'm going to paint a picture for Laker fans and for general NBA fans. This year's playoffs has been like if there was a nuclear holocaust, and there was only one gas station open and edible food available. But the, but the sa gas station Sam was about six months too old. And it's got gasoline dripping all over it, but it's the only thing for miles. That's what we would be forced to endure this year with these playoffs. Um, unfortunately, LeBron wasn't the only one that saw this coming. Uh, Arash Marquet, uh had a couple of really good weeks uh, this evening that said health officials from Basically, all 50 states predicted this would happen in the NBA. A short layoff with a minimal rest. Um, players aren't getting their seven, eight hours of sleep that they require. Uh, there are a multitude of factors that led up to this. Uh, but one thing we can say is hopefully next year it's an 82 game season we can get some sense of normalcy because we sure as hell didn't get this year 
That's right, indeed. But again, for the best place to go for all your NBA news, information, and of course, anything on the Lakers. And if you want to share your thoughts on what's going on with the Lakers and everything that goes on in the NBA, there's no better place to go than Lakerholics.com. Well, I want to go ahead and thank everybody from Lakerholics.com. Also, everybody watching and listening. We will be back on Monday for you listening out there. And if you're watching us on Facebook, you can go ahead and catch us on Sunday night as we go ahead and tape another great episode of the Lakers Fast Break Podcast. <laughs> Jamie, we're dropping the Angels knowledge on us. Hey, they can't pitch. They can't win. Simple as that. That's all it takes. Uh, Otani can go ahead and pitch. Rec just and, recognize, and I'm saying just rec recognize greatness. Trey Young. He, he can hit all the home runs he wants, and he can pitch all the complete games he wants. Show hey Otani. They, he can't greatness. make up for the fact that the Angels really suck at starting pitching outside of him. And that's, that, you know. It's, <laughs> oh, don't leave the bullpen out, Gerald. Don't yeah, leave that's, the bullpen yeah, out. That's like, that's like <laughs> gasoline on. on the fire. That's right. Yeah. It's it's Sean's description of the NBA yeah. playoffs as the Angels yeah. uh, this season and many seasons prior. Pretty, pretty All much. Oh, God, is, Jamie. Uh, recognize the, the bullpen is three times as bad as the Angels statistically. So <laughs> It's as bad as Ben Simmons' free throw shooting, which oh, costs boy. Philadelphia the game right now. <laughs> hey, so hey, I will tell you that. Lonzo Ball improved his free throw shooting. It can be done. It can, it can be, be done. done. It just got to work at it. But that's yeah. another that's another podcast for another day. But I'll tell you what, it's going to be great as we continue to go ahead and update you on the NBA playoffs. We'll be back on, again, Monday if you're listening to us. We're going to talk about what the Lakers need to do. Plus, we will give you an update on the NBA playoffs as Brooklyn faces off in game six against Milwaukee on Thursday, and then you have the games with Atlanta and Philadelphia, and also as well you have the Clippers and Jazz. Will all those series end in the next couple of days? Who knows what's going on, but I'll tell you what, it's been organized chaos, like I said, here in the NBA. We appreciate you listening. We appreciate you watching, but join us again on Monday. And please also don't forget, Father's Day is just around the corner. If you haven't gotten a gift yet, Best place to go, manscaped.com. If you type in the code as one word, fast break, 20% off. You laugh, Tom. You laugh. But manscaped.com is the best men's grooming product that's out there. 20% off plus free shipping if you type in the code fast break. But, guys, it's been great talking to you about this organized chaos known as the NBA. We'll be back, to hopefully, with a lot more news. And I think we will. Uh, coming up here in the next couple of days, but we'll be back on Monday right here at the Lakers Fast Break Podcast. Whew. I wonder what more news is going to happen here. I know, we'll find right? Out next week.